Welcome back to Friends from Work. I'm Kyle Skonawil. He's Robbie Earl, and I'm coming at you live, if you're watching on video here, from one of, if not the most beautiful place in our country. That's right. Monterey Peninsula, home of, if you're a golfer, Golf Mecca, Pebble Beach, Spyglass Hill, Cypress Point, all in the same area. Monterey Peninsula Country Club. It's Golf Mecca. So, wow. Happy to be here. Wow. You know, it's not just Golf Mecca. The what Monterey is Peninsula is also where I come from originally. No, that's yeah. not true. I mean, I I wasn't like, I, I grew up in Louisiana. I was born in Monterey. Because your dad was out here on a golf trip? <laughs> that's why. <laughs> it could. I mean, it is funny. My dad wound up going back there. Uh, to go to Pebble Beach. So that makes sense. But no, my dad was uh, in the Navy when I was uh, oh. born. So they were stationed there at the time. All right. Born in a naval hospital. Wow. You know how I know that part of it? Because of one of your songs from Robbie Earl's music, the greatest uh, music that is on Spotify right now, if you search it. <laughs> um, I have so many thoughts I want to share with you. It's been a while, it feels like, since we've talked. And I have so many thoughts I want to yeah. share with you about being out here. One, the whole peninsula has a thing called the 17-mile drive, and it's so beautiful. If you ever get a chance to come out here, even not for golf, you can do a 17-mile drive. It's like a park, and you just go through some of the most beautiful area. You can go by the big – I think it's Big Speed Bridge. Uh, don't quote me on that. The, the famous hmm. bridge from like the Mac uh, um, screensavers, you know, and the, and the desktop oh, wallpapers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, right here by Big Sur. It's just such a beautiful area. Oh, man, it's so good to be out here. Um, the second thing is I had an hour and 15-minute drive from the airport to get out here, and then my car, my rental car, has incredible speakers. And, dude, I had to drive it from like 11.15 till midnight, which was 2 o'clock my body's time, and I oh, just geez. cranked some of the Journey Through the MCU playlist at oh, full nice. volume. Dude, some of those tracks, oh, my gosh, Robbie, they get me going. Holy cow. The WandaVision stuff like really moves me, but I posted this on social media at the FFW podcast. Mama's Got a Brand New Hammer might be my single favorite track on the entire playlist, which is so shocking because that was like the one track that I isolated early on is like, I don't know if they did great music. But then, Robbie, that just got me thinking about you because I posted on social media. I think it's hands down. Thor has the greatest music in the MCU, right? It's not even really a debate. Isn't that crazy? I think so, you're right. Dude, and it's four different people, but every yeah. single entry is legendary. I mean, I can still listen to the Patrick Doyle stuff right now, and it moves me. You know yeah. how I feel about Brian Tyler. Then the Mark Mothersbaugh taking those that stuff and adding the 80s vibes and combining it. And then a yeah. total reset for Love and Thunder that still blows my mind and literally makes me tear up. Holy crap. You know what I kind of like about that, too, is I, I've been thinking a lot lately about the similarities between the Marvel Comics universe and the MCU and, and how, really, for the most part, the, the, the main difference has been that, like, comics, even though they're in the same continuity, they kind of have to continually reinvent themselves with each creative team, mm -hmm. whereas I think the MCU has generally tried to feel more cohesive yeah. and so that's why when we do have projects like Captain America where the the back two-thirds at least are from the Russos or Spider-Man yeah. where all three films are from John Watts like that's that seems to be preferable uh but I think that's one thing that I, I kind of enjoy about the Thor movies that we don't get there is that you do actually like for for whatever people want to say about any of those four movies, and that's kind of one of the funny things, is you can go and ask someone what their favorite is. And aside from Ragnarok, it's kind of a toss-up what people would say. Like, I think generally people would say Ragnarok's the best. But then I think even some people have, like, preferences for others. And I guess my point is, like, whether you're talking about the directors or the composers, I kind of appreciate that that is a franchise where you get just, like, very specific takes sure. 
you know, each time through. Uh, you you do have two Taika films, obviously, but even those feel different and and have different folks involved. But the other thing, the other thing besides diving into the playlist, which everyone should do, by the way. As we talked about last week, we get hundreds and hundreds of dollars from you listening on Spotify. <laughs> uh, um, I have so much time when I'm out here and I'm by myself. So in the last week alone, I have rewatched Oppenheimer. I watched the movie 21 Bridges for the first time, Shutter Island, mm. and then all three of the Maze Runner films from that trilogy. And so like I like to do on social media, I want to really quickly do a 30-second Kyle review of each one. Obviously, we don't have time to get into all of them, but I just have so I many thoughts it. I want to share. First of all, with Oppenheimer, I showed Annika for the first time. I watched it. When I posted my original review, I remember saying, it's one of the best movies I've seen. It's going to win Best Picture, but I don't know if I ever need to see it again. I stand totally corrected on that last point. I am yeah, correct on, it is literally one of the best movies I've ever seen. If that's the kind I of thing you that. You did. And it inspired me to do it. But watching it, it was that experience of watching it again, but with Annika for the first time. So it kind of feels like the first time vicariously. Oh, I, wait. Okay. Sorry. I missed that. Annika had never seen it at all. Nope. We had a baby. It's wow. hard to get out to the theater. I saw it as a screener. She didn't go with me. And then we just never pulled the trigger on it. Um, I didn't know if it'd be totally her movie. It is totally my movie because it's Nolan. It's the actors I like, but then also I love right. the historical side of it. And so like my mm -hmm. mind has such a hard time wrestling with the fact that that stuff really happened, which is crazy. Um, but man, seeing it through her eyes again, it's not only one of the greatest films I've ever seen legitimately. Um, it should win all the awards, but I did need to see it again because you know, there's so many names in that film. That yeah. the first watch, it's not only hard to hear what they're saying, but you lose track of all these names, like General this person and this person and this mm -hmm. scientist. And I think on a second watch, when you kind of put a name with a face, you start seeing the genius of Christopher Nolan, where like planting the seeds of this character being unsettled yeah. or this character being in the Communist Party or blah, blah, blah. So like, dude, I mean, the acting, the, the editing, uh, I mean – if you're into historical films with like a clever twist, that sequence when he's like, I'm sure the Japanese didn't like it, but it's cutting to the people with their faces melting off. It's Dude, just, I, I could go I, on for hours and hours. We have, we have a, we have an hour and a half episode on this podcast. You can find on screensaver of us covering Oppenheimer. So go listen to that. But yeah, my mind was still blown. Continue. I no, I, yeah. And I can't get into it cause I'll never stop, but it's, Correct. it's like, I, I am convinced, and Candace can back this up because I get so uh, I get so obsessive about things that I'm very into, and I it's every level of that movie. But the the score, it, I sure. can't stop listening to even lately. Like I've I've been listening to it just on repeat. It's like the it's one of the best film scores I've ever heard. It is like when you watch the film, the performances, like you said, like it's, it's this crazy thing where it's like all the way down, just everybody showed up and killed it to where I like, I was telling, I think I was telling Candace the other day, it's like there are, there are years where, uh, like when Parasite won, right? Yep. Like there were several films that were up that year that yep. I was really excited about where like I... I was kind of like, you know, there are like, I think legitimately three or four movies that I would be excited to see win. And then Parasite won. And I was like, oh, that's actually really cool because that feels like kind of a dark horse here. And this movie's so great. But that's normally how I come into the Oscars. I'm like, there are several good options. You know, sure. I maybe prefer this one. This is one of the years where like, if Oppenheimer doesn't win, I'm going to be legitimately upset. If Nolan doesn't win a Best Picture and Best Director, then I just don't think they like him. There's nothing he could physically do because this is finally out of the mind-bending type genre. So, like, this is not sci-fi. Right. Like, there's no excuse here for this one to not win. Um, and I haven't seen all of the films in that category, admittedly. But And then, not to toot my own horn, but if you remember, I actually got to see Oppenheimer before you in my screener, and that's what I texted mm -hmm. you. I said... If he, if he doesn't win best score or at least best like sound editing, I will be stunned. That's what I said last July yeah. or whatever when it came out. And, and Gordonson has, he's already been cleaning up in, across like the other kind of auxiliary award shows. 
hmm. uh, leading into this. I think he won the Golden Globe, potentially. Uh, Could be. But in, they, in general, I think Oppenheimer folks have been cleaning up. Yeah, I think they won five Golden Globes. Don't fact but check me on that. Okay, we got to keep moving. We have so much to do today. Uh, 21 Bridges, Chadwick Boseman. Never seen it before. Wow, a detective. I haven't seen that either. It's a cop movie um, with Chadwick Boseman, and I think it was just kind of, it caught my eye because I was like, Chadwick, man, I haven't seen Chadwick. Yeah. And so that was wild. I thought it was pretty good. Um, not unbelievable. I'd say 75%. Uh, Shutter Island. We're going to talk about this at length on Screensaver Plus, I believe, uh, for Friends mm-hmm. from Work Plus listeners. Um an unbelievable movie, so I'm not going to get into it now, but I'm in a weird headspace because you know when you turn that movie off, <laughs> it's not uplifting. <laughs> um, and then I watched all three Maze Runner films, to which I, I have a couple hot takes here. Fascinating. You've never seen any of them, right? No. Um, John Pazino, our boy with the music, uh, he talked about that in his interview with us. Um I, I was fascinated to see how these received were received on uh, Rotten Tomatoes because it's a it's like the young adult genre that typically would not uh-huh. do well. Remember like Divergent and Hunger Games yeah, yeah. and like um, th- these. Are, uh, it, I looked it up. The first Maze Runner has seventy five percent ish, and then the second two are like forty five to fifty percent. And mm. uh, here's a couple things. One, I think it's by far the best trilogy of that genre. Like, it, it never really gets super cheesy like the young adult uh, genre does. It's it's way uh-huh. darker and twistier and actually legitimately scary at times um, huh. that the young adult genre doesn't get into. The first movie, I still think, if you're into that headspace, is really good. Like, I'd go above 75%. I'd say the first one, twist that you can't predict, it takes bold swings that you're like, that's that's where they're going uh, in a cool way. I'd say okay. the first, the first movie's like, 82%. Like, it's a good movie. I really do think huh. that. Um, you can't predict where it's going. That's what's wild. I have and no then, idea what it's about. Yeah. So, I think the first movie is so fresh of a take. And I think that's why it has 75%. Because it's like, whoa, in this genre, how is mm. this so fresh? And the second two movies kind of fall into the typical genre tropes. And I think that's why they're reviewed lower. But I would say, yes, I agree. The second movie review, 45% is fair. The third one, though, is better than 50%. The third one should be like a 60. So I'd go like 80, 45, okay. 60. Uh, I think, though, but definitely... You, you'd stick with the 45 for the second one. The second one's kind of just a generic, like, you know, book adaptation into, into screen. Uh, it's it's not great. But I do think overall it's better than uh, most of that genre. And it's our boy Will Poulter in there. So kind of fun to see oh, him. Oh, you know, wow. Um, is he like the the lead, like the no, main? No, but he's okay. uh, it's it's a cast. It's a it's like a group of boys, kind of like okay on an island, if you will. That's it's not an island, but you you will see it if you ever watch it. And then the last thing I got to share, and then we get, we'll get into the awards, is as I was watching all these films, no, what popped up on my television was Dark Phoenix, and I watched oh like yeah. <laughs> sixty seconds of it and thought this must be Dark Phoenix. It was a little girl who could control the radio with her mind, and I'm thinking. What is this? She's redhead. It's got to be Dark Phoenix. I, I can't even confirm that. But I immediately uh-huh. turned it off for your sake. Not because I don't want to see wow. it, but because I'm going to save myself for Friends from Work Plus. End of my Kyle reviews. Excellent. <laughs> Dark I, Phoenix. Uh, <laughs> oh, Dark Phoenix, baby. Man, I am... Uh, I'm excited to pick back up with our, uh, our X-Men rewatch for a variety of reasons on a yep. Friends from Work Plus, but that is Let's go. neither here nor there. Okay, everybody, this is Friends from Work. It's a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and every year we award some, some friendly awards to performers, writers, directors, and people that we think were worth appreciation from the MCU in 2023. And these awards are determined by our Friends From Work Plus community. So these are not Robbie and my votes. This is our community's votes. So this is your voice, our listeners, picking these awards. And what's fun about this, outside of four categories today, I do not know the winners. So Robbie is going to present these to you. These are voted on by you, and I'm going to be as surprised as you are. So here we go. Without further ado, welcome to the 2024 Friendly Awards, the winners. I feel like we need some, like, 
dun, 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 well, dun, dun, dun. that just shows me that you didn't listen to last week's episode back because I did edit in our friendly award music. So I'll put that in oh, again right now. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so you're excellent. talking over the okay. music right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Mm-hmm. First up, then, we have best addition to the MCU. Our nominees, Adam Warlock, Sonya Fallsworth, Gaia, Cahorty, and OB. And the winner is, of Ooh. course, OB okay, okay. from Loki Season 2 by a landslide. Really? Is this going to start a trend in the friendlies? First of all, congratulations to OB. Yeah. You know, it is interesting, right? Uh, there are... It's certainly like, I think when you step back and this is not me, I have not actually looked at, I've seen some of the votes coming in. I have not looked at all of the winners all the way down, at least not uh, since all of the votes came in, Mm -hmm. but it is interesting. Like, and, and, you know, we try to create the categories in a way, like we said last time to allow for some dark horses, but certainly I think the general sense that I have coming into this is that. Loki on the TV side, Guardians on the film side are going to kind of be the the champions. So yeah. I'm more I'm curious to see where those expectations are are incorrect uh and where it kind of toes the party line. Yeah. I think that's going to totally be the case. I do hope that there were certain categories that when I went through and voted, I did not vote for those two. And I do hope that Mm -hmm. our audience was able to appreciate some small things from some of the others. Like I do think that by far, those were the two best projects last year, but that doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that every other project then was bad. Like for example, for me, I thought the acting in secret invasion was really good. And at at, at times I thought the acting was Mm -hmm. more uh, compelling to me than some of the Loki acting even mm-hmm. though I thought Loki is a way better show. So we'll be yeah, out yeah. to see. No, Congrats I think that's a good, and, and like we've said before, uh, there's no reason why just because a movie as a whole is better, that that means every piece is better than every other piece of, of other projects. You yeah, know? correct. Uh, so, which that said, here we go. Number two here, we have our best team-up award. The nominees being Scott and Cassie Lang, Quantumania, Nebula and Peter Quill, Groot and Peter Quill, Nick Fury and Talos, Loki and Obi, Cahorty and Captain Carter, and Carol, Kamala, and... Oh, there he did it again! Yes! Kamala! And Carol, (laughs) Kamala, and Monica. Listeners of this show will know that that goes back at least a year and a half. Man, I love. I know. I know. I uh, no, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Okay, uh, <laughs> the winner here is Carol, Kamala, yes! and Monica from yes, the let's Marvels. Go. Let's go. So and there you go. I'm glad we had that conversation. Yes, because- I, I didn't know that. We had that conversation before I knew the answer to that category. And that makes me really happy. That's a perfect example of what I was talking about. Like, Mm -hmm. is the Marvels better than Guardians? No. But it has clearly, in my opinion, the best team up. As far as a team up goes, let's go. Congrats. Man, you know what? Yeah, I also, I don't think, I'm really excited to revisit the Marvels. Because it is not. There's not a massive gap between those movies. And maybe that's my hot take, but like... Oh, that is a hot take, but I, I'm weirdly with you. I'm weirdly with you. I said this so many times in that episode. So many people tuned out the Marvels because of what it was ahead of time. And I went in with low expectations and it significantly exceeded them. Like mm-hmm. the Marvels coming out on Disney Plus on February 7, which is in a few days... Is, oh, wow. That's sooner than I thought. Okay. Yes, correct. Is one of the more anticipated rewatches on Disney Plus for me. Seriously. Not kidding. I had, yeah, I had I'm a really lot of fun when that. I watched it. Yeah, oh, same. Same. So I'm glad to see that. Okay. But next up, we have best action sequence. Oh, wait. And wait. This one I do mm-hmm. know because... I don't think we said this at the top. Uh... 
for a select few people, uh, super friends on Friends from Work Plus. These are people that support our podcast at the highest tier. A few of them sent me videos reading a few of the categories uh, ahead of time. And so we have a guest for this one. And I'm going to let that guest do the talking, okay? What's up, friends from work? It's me, the other Greg, and I'm thrilled that I am included in this year's Friendly Awards. I get to announce the best action sequence in the MCU. Without further ado, the nominees are Scott Battles Kang from Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. (laughs) Next is the Tunnel Fight from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Then we have the death of Talos from Secret Invasion. Next is pulling Loki from the loom from Loki Season 2. From What If Season 2, we have the Strange Supreme. And last but not least, we have trading spaces from the Marvels. And the winner is... The Tunnel Fight from Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. Thanks for including me in this super fun podcast. I'm psyched to be a part of it. And piss off, Ghost. Wow. I love the effort from Greg there. There's a lot to love there. I think that there was also a Midtown Comics hat. Friends from Work shirt? Classic one? Explosions. Explosions? And uh, and he wasn't looking at them, so like all badasses, he was walking away from them without even oh, being true. startled. Yeah, classic Iron Man one. Uh, uh, tunnel fight, obviously. What yeah, an absolute yeah, good. classic! It's and and another that you know, looking at our uh, looking at our results here, just a a, a landslide win. Well, here. and and thank thank you, Greg. By the way, that was really cool. Thanks for sending that in. And lastly, I'll just say, Robbie, uh, this one I thought should have been a landslide. Not that the other scenes weren't interesting, but Mm -hmm. in an action type movie to have a scene this dedicated solely to the action and the choreography like needs to be rewarded. You know, like that's the whole point of that. They could have just had them shoot a few people Mm -hmm. and go through the tunnel. But to actually put that much effort into a what three minute long kind of one shot vibe. Pretty cool, man. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I I also think James Gunn generally delivers on, not just the action, but the mechanics of things. Like, I, I think that that's where there are other films besides James Gunn films, both in the MCU and, and outside of the MCU, just a superhero genre in general, that I think do a lot of things better. But I mm. do think whenever it comes to, like, him trying to, ground things the the thought that he puts into the execution like you rarely come away from a james gunn film feeling like something was was half-baked correct and this is a great example of that and he's really good at capturing the action sequences uh it's kind of like him and the rousseau brothers for me in the mcu you know they have a little Mm -hmm. bit of that grounding action feel that other people just don't attempt to do maybe as much man which Um, is why infinity war was such a unique moment yep. because yeah, I, I feel like you really had those styles combining but St- still to this day one of the best theater experiences of my life infinity war mm-hmm. it still will be and it will be <laughs> to my grave i think it will be when i show my daughter when she's old enough you know okay you said this next category is also a landslide what was it yes the next category is best villain king the conqueror high evolutionary gravic he who remains strange supreme and Darben. You know, we talk on this podcast all the time about how you and I can never guess Pete's, our manager's leanings, you know, and this stuff. Uh-huh. Like, we never know if he's going into an MCU film if he's going to like it at all. Do you ever have any idea when you text him out of the screen? Oh, no, <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, he texted, oh, this category is going to be a landslide for Kang. And I said, wow, I don't think so. It's going to be a landslide for High Evolutionary. And he was like, oh, really? But that's what it's going to be, right? That's the answer. That's my guess. And the winner of the 2024 Friendly Award for Best Villain goes to... The High Evolutionary from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. The winner is Gravik. 
No, no, no it's high evolution. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You actually startled me for a second. <laughs> I, you know, oh, that would have made me so happy, though. Not because I like Gravik, just because I uh, like to be surprised. But, no, it, it, I, it is high evolutionary. I think that so many problems would have been avoided for our community in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania if one detail was changed. If they changed one detail, I think that entire movie gets remembered differently. And the sole detail they should have changed is that Kang does not get defeated by Scott at the very end. Like maybe Scott mm. gets pulled out by Hope, but it's not because Kang is stopped. I think that one detail would have given him a shot at winning best villain because I think people don't vote in best villain because he was, quote, defeated. I really do believe that. Yeah. Man, I, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a crazy thing because – I mean, you know, a year ago when we were seeing this movie, it was very much billed as this is the new Thanos. This is the new villain that we're all working towards. He had had a, an incredible appearance in Loki season one. Right. And so if he had beaten Scott there, that would have been yeah. along those lines. We would have been like, oh, yeah, shoot. I, I think people also think the movie now is pointless because he did win. Does that make sense? I don't feel the way. Still- well, but I, I also just wonder, like, if if the... See, I think if you remove the Jonathan Majors controversy from this, I, I also feel like... Like, I think that it, it's hard because I actually think it, when you take Loki's two seasons and combine them with Quantumania, you're probably right. I, I, I never minded the, the King the Conqueror ending because I didn't feel like Scott really defeated him I felt like it was kind of a you know the whole line is like I don't have to win like both of us just have to lose right where it's like he because he's just using the tech and it's kind of like he's using Kang's hubris against him so I feel like there's a way to to still you know it, it, it creates a winning moment for Scott but then even the end of that movie I, I really loved because it's like did so I, I win though or but the it's just I think it's so, and this might actually not be the case once we see how all of it plays out with what Marvel decides to do with Kang and everything. But I think it's just weird for people now because it's like, what even is the status of that character? You know, like I know, are, I know. you know, are they picking up with them or are we? You know, it, are they going to shuffle him off the the stage? Because it was leading. Well, like you said, it felt like it was leading toward a Thanos-level thing. I will always look back in disappointment. I know the off-screen thing, you know, that messes everything up. But I will look back from a writing perspective in disappointment at if that if that was the end of it, just because the threat then never got to the point where I wanted it to get. But I yeah. understand, you know, there's other circumstances. I think I'm in the camp of recast and keep going. <laughs> Like to to then because I think if you made him super terrifying and a huge part of Secret Wars, then I think Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania will be looked back on more fondly in the future. Yeah, but I think yeah. if you get away from it, then it's going to always kind of be this weird dud for people. That that I think I think that part bums me out. Like I think I'm too loyal. I I, I want to come back around more yeah. than like the Dark World kind of thing. It uh, is like yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we could do a whole man, episode I, on that. <laughs> I know, I know, and I, I, you know, there's also I, I think since we last recorded, I don't know if you saw the the quote from uh, Matthew Vaughn, who directed nope. X Men First Class, but also uh, Argyle, the movie that is currently in theaters that uh, okay is not getting great reviews, but anyway, because of his kind of Marvel connection and X-Men connection, he spoke about Deadpool 3, and apparently he's seen at least either bits and pieces of the movie or the script or knows, like, story elements, and said that he thinks, based on what he's seen, that Deadpool 3 is going to single-handedly, quote, save the MCU, and that uh, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman are basically coming in to save the day in some way that we can't even imagine. Now, again, 
of course, he, you know, he's not going to not say that. He's invested in like that side of the franchise and baked into that is this idea that the MCU needs saving and yada, yada, yada. Tom Cruise I'm and not, Stephen King also said that The Flash is one of the best movies they've seen. So, you know, just let's just... Let's just wait, Tom that. Cruise did? Yes, that was the whole thing. Tom Cruise saw The wow. Flash and like died on that hill that he loved it so much. Um, and like contacted the studio. So anyway, but yeah. I mean, <laughs> like I like I, I like The Flash. Anyway, but <laughs> I, I think that I do wonder that with a movie that's mm. so fourth wall breaking, they're they're gonna have to they're gonna have to deal with the, the Oh, the major I stuff. would have to imagine that they would deal with the King stuff there. Maybe not. But it would be a good opportunity. TBD. Next category. Anyways, we didn't even talk about the high evolutionary. High evolutionary is terrifying. I voted for high evolutionary. Thought it was, like I said, one of the villains that in the MCU that like the most hated, like most punchable villain. Like if mm -hmm. I was in the movie, I was, if, if it was real and I was Star-Lord, I would understand wanting to just murder this dude. <laughs> That's like, and, and so, that, so I have to give props to him because he just genuinely is repulsive. I also love the motivation of that villain. Sure. Uh, as opposed, Perfection. you know, as opposed to Kang, even where you know Kang is just like I, I, he wants to conquer things. Ultimately, I mean, he likes like the challenge. He wants to be a winner, and I do like that high evolutionary. It, yeah, it's this like perfectionism where he's like he's not really. I mean, he is malevolent, but it's more like yeah, I'm going to scrap this entire planet because I messed up, and there's no room for that, and I, I'm going to get it exactly right. Like I just think that's an interesting take there uh, but so far all my votes are aligned with the community so i'm hoping we break that trend at some point next best romance we only had three nominees here scott and hope nick fury and priscilla and steve rogers and captain carter okay this could be it and with our first secret invasion win oh, of the year wow. We have Nick Fury and Priscilla taking it. Congratulations. Weirdly, okay, yeah. we broke the trend. I voted uh, for Captain Carter, and my second vote would have been Scott and Hope. Wow. And yeah, yeah. Wow. Crazy. I don't okay. Know. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love uh, it too. Congratulations, well, Secret Invasion, winning a friendly. <laughs> Let's go. Man. <laughs> and I, uh, Wow. Yeah, I love that. I did not. That's not one that I had reviewed before. As uh, it, Like we said last year, not as obvious of a category this year. We didn't have some like, you know, obvious yeah, slam yeah. dunk romances. Now, this next category, I, I think, is really interesting because there, there were a lot of, uh, of good contenders here. And that is our best supporting actress uh, okay. category. And... Just reading oh, yeah. these off, I, I, you know, I think it's kind of clear that we had a lot of good contenders. But Michelle Pfeiffer, yes, Olivia Coleman, Sophia yes. Di Martino, Devery Jacobs, and Iman Balani. I should say Iman Balani got uh, basically a, a negligible amount of votes. That was kind of a glitch because she wound up in the leading category as well. So I want to say that now. But wah, the wah, other, wah, wah. I know, I know, I know. the <laughs> other bad. contenders here uh, actually split the vote in, in an admirable way. But we do still have a clear winner with over fifty-five percent of the vote. I don't know. This is going to be, and I think this might surprise you. It Please. is Olivia Coleman Secret as Sonya Invasion. Falsworth. Second win <laughs> for Secret Invasion. Look at that. That is shocking, not as a slight on her because I think she's unbelievable in that show. I, I just yeah, charismatic yeah, yeah. from the get go, yeah. uh, terrifying in a in a cool way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did not think she would win that. Wow! Congratulations to Olivia Colman. Yeah, man. But you know, again, that's what I love. Like I, I feel, I actually feel great about both of those wins for that show, and okay. that's what I like to see here. Good job. So, Good job, community. Give a round of applause. <laughs> okay, best supporting actor. Michael Douglas, Will Poulter, Ben Mendelsohn, Owen Wilson, Chris Hemsworth, and Samuel L. Jackson. From the Marvels, I should specify. Samuel. And the, 
Chill, Jackson. <laughs> Samuel. <laughs> Shout out, Candace. <laughs> and the winner is Owen Wilson as Mobius, Loki season two. You know what? I don't think I voted for Owen Wilson. Not because I, you know, I freaking love Owen Wilson. Highlight of the show for me. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't think this season was, was as much about him and Loki. Like that first season is so much buddy cop. I would have voted for him. I think I did last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but congratulations. Not mad about it. I, uh, I, you know, I like it. There are some layers to the performance here that we didn't get as much in uh, in the first season, just because we kind of get to delve deeper. Yep. But him I, I will like say, that last shot. Oh gosh, that's good, man. This is this is a yeah. This is a stacked category for me as well, though. Uh, I, I I think my second pick would probably weirdly be Will Poulter, which is like an element of Guardians Three that I feel like a lot of people don't talk about, but I thought he was really funny in that Hmm. role. Uh, And, you know, I I think that's worth a shout out. It doesn't always have to be a uh, a moving supporting actor performance. Shout out Maze Runner. uh, Shout out Maze Runner, apparently. (laughs) Okay, best surprise appearance. This is always a fun one. Uh, We have... As a reminder, Corey Stoll as Modoc, Tom Hiddleston yes. and Owen Wilson in the Ant Man Quantumania post credit scene, Sylvester Stallone in Guardians, Nathan Fillion in Guardians. Uh, we have Rick Mason showing up in Secret Invasion from Black Widow, Tessa Thompson as Valkyrie in the Marvels, Haley Steinfeld as Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop in the Marvels, and Kelsey Grammer as Beast in the Marvels. Okay, I just want to say real quick. One, Pete thought we should have added Bill Murray to this, which is understandable. But I think you and I kind of ruled that because he was in the trailer, right? Mm-hmm. He was in that last trailer. Um, I think he, one of the early trailers even. Yeah, maybe. So it's not really surprising then. So we kind of ruled that one out. I think that Corey Stoll should win this award. I really do because most surprising. You have to yeah, have yeah, you have to have yeah. like a notable actor with something that nobody could have guessed. Like truly you were like, "What?" And mm-hmm. and it's a former MCU callback. So like Nathan Fillion mm-hmm. is is surprising, but that's not that's not that crazy to add a new actor in a different right. role. Right? Like that is surprising. I would give honorable mention to the Marvels. Like, like Valkyrie surprised me. That one really surprised mm-hmm. me. Haley Steinfeld really surprised me. But again, because of the tie-in, I get it. I just remember when Modoc like revealed that it was Corey Stoll, Darren Cross. Oh man. I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, what a genius call. Because in the first day, man, he shrunk yeah. into like oblivion. <laughs> it's perfect. Man, I yeah, I and that's again, it's one of those things where I I'm so curious to see how that movie ages. I, I know that it was, it's so silly for a lot of people, but that's one of those things that I really appreciate from like a, a symmet- like a, from a symmetry perspective where that was a thing that just kind of got like lopped off a bit. Uh, you know, it was one of those like early MCU, like one and done villains. And I, I love that we yeah. brought him back. I that, would love if we got Christopher Eccleston back as uh, as Malekith. Come on. That movie, I want a, I want a no-armed hey, Malekith out there. Hey, Thor Dark World, look at you. <laughs> that movie is, is viewed well in my books because it's fun and it's funny. Like when I say funny, to me, it's my humor. I laugh out loud like seven to eight times in that film and just very few films in the MCU actually make me do that. When mm-hmm. Michael Douglas goes, Darren? Holy sh! Like it makes me laugh <laughs> out loud. Um, the I'm an Avenger. Uh, it's never too late to stop being a dick. Like there are moments. A lot in has that, happened today. <laughs> a lot has happened today. Makes me literally tear up. I laugh so hard when and, and like the the right after. Just like Jeff loved has told us. Remember right after the, the uh, uh-huh. he, he dies. He goes. A lot has happened today. Is such a good commentary. That's such a good joke. If that's not funny yeah. to you, I think you're just. I don't know. That's not your humor, I guess. But that's it for me, man. <laughs> a lot no, has I. Uh... Yeah, man, that fascinating movie to to, to talk about. I, we're we're gonna have to do a like five years later, you know, we'll a, get, assuming we'll, that we make it that long. We're gonna get to it on our rewatch. Uh, okay, continue. But uh, 
Okay, next category, best score. Now it's getting serious. Okay. Christoph Beck for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, John Murphy, Guardians 3, Chris Bauer, Secret Invasion, Natalie Holt, Loki Season 2, and Laura Cartman twice, one for the Marvels and one for What If Season 2. I just want to say, I was thinking about this the other day, talking about like the Journey Through the MCU playlist. Man, this is a stacked category. Like, I, I know that, like, Secret Invasion is actually a great example here of, like, that was a theme that from the get-go, even whenever I was like, oh, man, oh, I am not into the show. The Chris the theme, Bauer I was Secret like, Invasion this is theme. great. Oh, that theme, man, is so good. And I'm just like, I was a fan of what John Murphy did on Guardians 3 after being really kind of skeptical of bringing in a new composer. And we talked about Quantumania. We had Christoph Beck on to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it will come as a surprise to anyone that the winner of this award is Natalie Holt. Yeah, congratulations. For score for friend of the pod. Two. Big time friend, friend of the pod. pod. And two time friend as, of the pod. Yeah, and as uh, it, which reminded me, we need to have her back on because she was excited to come back on and talk about uh, yeah. her work in those last two episodes. We can present and her. Understandably so. We can present the award to her. That's true. That's true. My we only hot take. Like a, my only hot uh -huh. take I'll add here. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the only hot take I'll add, and maybe this is not that hot, but if you go through the journey through the MCU playlist, I think that the music. Again, we talk about not lumping everything into the same category. I think the music is better now than it ever was at the beginning. Man, I, I, I agree. I agree. So, like, I think I would say around, like, Ragnarok, 2017 to 2024, the music is mm -hmm. better. Like, significantly better in the MCU if you took that seven-year period versus 2008 to 2017. And I don't think it's even I really totally particularly agree. close. Okay. No, no. There are a couple of standouts early yes, on, sure. mostly the, the the Silvestri stuff, honestly. And I like but, the Thor stuff. I'm not criticizing all of it, but but yeah, I no, I I, I had the same thought. Like uh, the, the secret the secret invasion theme is a perfect example of like it is such a cool theme, like a theme that we didn't get for a lot of characters early on, and it's in a show mm -hmm. that nobody liked, but it was awesome. Well, and man. I mean, even even talking about Natalie Holt's Loki score, it's easier to talk about because that that show is generally well received. But can you imagine yep. getting anything like that score Early ten on. years ago in in How, the MCU? I think I think that what Hajam Nazi did with Moon Knight is so cool. The the theme yeah, music there, yeah. the choir work, and I think that uh, Eternals has great tracks. Did you ever play the Fallout games? On uh, you probably didn't. That wasn't really your era. Because I feel like no. you were you were both pre and post those, yeah, but yeah. Um, I have I, I'm shouting that out because this is my like this is my I don't know if maybe this has been announced now so it's not a bold prediction. I feel like uh, Ramin Jawadi is going to wind up doing the music for the Fallout show that's coming from Jonathan Nolan. I don't know if you followed this okay, as an Amazon no. series. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. The only reason I I think that that's happening is I saw uh, that he had like retweeted like a trailer for that series and the composer hadn't been announced yet and he obviously he worked with uh, Jonathan Nolan for Westworld mm. all that to say talking about best score I've been listening to the Westworld scores a ton I never watched past the first season of that show but I have listened to all of the season scores and love them so again another me. example of uh, well, just you know, an, an example of uh, some element of a of a series shining, even if the rest of the of the uh, project doesn't capture your attention. That was kind of like the pre show awards, and now we're going to hit the major <laughs> categories after a quick word from these sponsors. All right, this is our uh, our top eight to use the MySpace lingo. Okay. <laughs> Best post credit scene. <laughs> we have was it Tom? One. Tom was on everyone's top eight. Right? <laughs> Tom, yeah, right? 
<laughs> yeah, he was he was <laughs> he was my he was in my top eight all the way. Through. Sadly, we uh, are aging ourselves right now. Like half of our I crowd know. doesn't even get that, which is insane to think about. Yeah, man, we're getting old. I. Uh, oh man, yeah, we gotta have a whole episode on that aging ourselves <laughs> out. Jeez, but best <laughs> post credit scene. Council of Kings, yep. Amen in the Wasp, Quantumania, the New Guardians from mm-hmm. Guardians Three, and the Foxmen, uh, which is the uh, appearance of Kelsey Grammer, and uh, I guess it was just him and uh, Maria Rambo. Yeah, in, um, this, this has got to be a landslide for Beast, right? It is. It is. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would basically. Beast gets just over half, and then the rest of the vote was split. We we actually had some solid credit scenes. We didn't have a yeah. ton, which we talked about in our nominees episode, but the ones that we did get were were really good, I thought. Congrats again uh, to the Marvels. Let's go. Second award. Yes. Okay, this next category, I believe we have a patron here to announce, and that is best episode of a series. Hey everyone, it's Zach here. I'm just uh, announcing best episode of the series. Uh, best episode of the series is going to be Secret Invasion, episode four, Beloved. I'm just messing with you guys. It's actually going to be Loki season two, episode six, um, Glorious Purpose. Congrats, y'all. Wow, little Funko Pop action there. That's, I Love mean, that. I said in a little message to all of uh, the people that wanted to partake, I said, be creative. And we got some fun responses. So thank you yeah, for doing it. Yeah. Seriously, it warms our heart. Uh, we have occasionally on the main feed and on Friends from Work Plus done a mailbag episode. And it really does warm Robbie and I's heart to hear mm-hmm. voices and see faces of people that are actually listening. It's pretty cool. It's so crazy to see yeah. like there are people that I just never... Yep. You get so used to putting like their avatar pictures to their uh, yes correct. to their comments on Discord and whatnot, but but congratulations again to Loki. I thought that this was yeah. not a this is not a no brainer, but that finale was such a slam dunk. So and and this was a the landslide of landslides. This got eighty five percent of the vote. So yeah, what a finale! Wow, what uh, a finale. Uh, like we said last week, it should be noted that Loki has had two of the best finales, both in their first season and second season. So yeah. they're on a roll right now. Which yeah, brings man. us to our next category, question mark? Or Which brings ahead? us to our next category. Yeah. Uh, yeah, our nominees for best lead actor. Hello, friends from work listeners. I'm Joey, and I have been tasked with announcing the best lead actor in the MCU for this year's friendlies. The nominees are Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Chris Pratt as Star-Lord, Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury, and Tom Hiddleston as Loki. And the winner goes to Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Congratulations, your award will be in the mail. Okay, is that an organic price books? Yeah. Okay, Joey, longtime listener, how about the artwork showcase there? Well, I actually... Jacoby, our artwork drawer is so, our artist, I should say, I call them an artwork drawer. <laughs> <laughs> our, our artist for this stuff, our artwork drawer um, is so talented that I do think it is kind of special to get those framed. In my studio, yeah. that's how you walk up the stairs. I have them kind of stair-stepping up with you all four seasons, soon to be five. And then I'm going to start on the other side of the wall too. But seeing him like that, it just looks cool to see him all in a line, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah. Thanks, it Joey. It is nice. It is nice. Man, we're lucky with our uh, artwork for sure. And our listeners. Uh, Tom Hiddleston, and, congratulations. Well-deserved, well-earned, I think. Man, that's the thing. Yeah, I was I was thinking the other day, I saw a, one of these Disney Plus ads or something where they were... Uh, showing a a clip from an old, it was Avengers maybe, or the first Thor. And even when we, you know, we joke about Tom Hiddleston in that first Thor movie, and he's come such a long way. But even talking about the kind of era of the one and done villains and how Thor was kind of, I think, the only exception to that. Good point. You can kind of count the Red Skull, but that was a long time coming for a callback. Yeah. Uh, But man, I, I was just thinking... You know, I know that Greg has kind of been campaigning for putting Hiddleston on the the MCU Mount Rushmore. 
And in terms of just the performances he's turned in, the the impact that he personally has had, because I really think it is him personally. It's like the character, the character is an interesting character. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that the it's grown it's kind of just followed him. Like, I think he's taken the character where he wants to and made it something compelling for us. Like, I, I think that there are other people that they could have cast, even in the first Avengers film, that could have been not duds, but but kind of forgettable. One and duds. Like not, One and duds, yeah. Yeah, or characters that we were not wanting to see headline two seasons of a show 10 years later. And it, it's so yeah, that very well deserved. And and I think if this is the last we ever see of Loki, which I don't think it will be, but what a what an incredible turn uh, in this season. Agreed. Moving to best lead actress here, mm-hmm. uh, this is again a very stacked category. We have Karen Gillan, Zoe Zaldano, uh, Evangeline Lilly, Amelia Clark. Brie Larson, Tiana Paris, and Iman Vellani. Our winner I, I don't, here. I don't know this one. I don't know who's going to win. This is a hard I'm, one. I'm going to guess Iman, but I could go a lot of ways here. You would be right. Our winner for best lead actress is Iman Vellani. And again, very well deserved. Did she win best addition to the MCU last year? I, I There's two things I want to do after we hang up. I want to go back and look at our past winners and start tallying like total winners because I can't remember all of them. Mm. But that'd be fun to do. Mm-hmm. In fact, it'd just be fun to hear those episodes again uh, to relive that. And then two, I... I want to go back and revisit our bold predictions episode we did a couple of years ago or oh, a year ago yeah. and see how many came true and maybe do another one. Yeah, I mean, we should. we Because right. I think we promised that we would go back and see. Uh, yeah, I could play clips what? from it. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. Congrats, Iman. Um, you know mm-hmm. how I feel about her in particular. Um, there's yeah. just every once in a while in the MCU, there's a casting where you don't just go, oh, that's good. You go, that's a slam dunk for that character. I feel that way with Haley as Kate Bishop. And I feel that way Mm -hmm. here with Iman Vellani as Kamala. So I am to, uh, you were talking earlier about that coming out on Disney plus Candace never saw the Marvels uh, because I only saw it once. Like I saw the screener and then it, things got so busy in that season. You've you've not seen it again. Oh, I've seen it one time. Yeah. And she's not seen it at all. So I'm actually really looking forward to that. I think think Candace will like it. I think she will too. It's she short, was actually really excited it's short, about it. which she likes. Yeah. A ton of strong women, which she would like. And it's pretty mm-hmm. funny, I think. It is, yeah. Yeah, and she loves she loves Samuel, you know? Yes, uh, yeah. So. Okay. My money's I, on uh, her liking it. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. Uh, next category here, uh, which is the last of our acting categories, best voice actor. Mm-hmm. And again, between What If and Guardians, we've got quite a bit of nominees here. Bradley Cooper, Linda Carlini, Haley Atwell, Karen Gillan, Kate Blanchett, Jeff Goldblum, and Devery Jacobs. Again, as a reminder, showing up here as Cohorty, but also showed up in Echo. Uh, not something that we're reviewing here because that show came out in 2024, cool. and this yeah. is best of 2023. But our winner here, any guesses? Okay, this is my guess. I think it's going to be somewhat of a legacy award and that Bradley Cooper is going to win it as Rocket. But I not that he's not amazing, but I mainly think that that's our audience. I think they're going to be voting in favor of someone who, like, lifetime achievement in the MCU. <laughs> this, <laughs> is like, uh, this is like Return of the King winning, uh, what, 11 Academy Awards, but it's like right, kind right. of the whole trilogy. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. being like, oh, yeah, good work on all of them. And uh, you are correct. Yeah. Bradley Cooper winning best voice actor here with 66% of the wow. vote. I think Haley Atwell, I guess, would probably be second for me if I was voting. You know, our, our uh, actually, no, Haley was pretty, was pretty low here. Uh, okay. Our second place 
is Linda uh, from oh, Guardians wow. also. And then our wow. third place would be uh, Devery from uh, What If as Cohorty. So okay, those are kind of fun. I would not have picked those as being the second two. Oh, uh, sorry. I would pick those, and I feel like they're deserving. I would not have predicted those. Yes, correct. As the as the second two winners. But, thanks, th- uh, thanks for being politically correct on that. Thank you. you know. I was so nervous for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was holding their breath. Yeah. Hopefully, no one got Bobby's into an accident. Somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Best writer slash writing team. These are fun. Brought to you by our friend Jay. Oh yes, yes. Hey, Ravi. Hey, Kyle. It's Jalen, and I'm here to announce the winner for Best Writer slash Writing Team. Your winner is Eric Martin from his work on Loki Season 2. Let's go. Thank you, guys. Reading reading from the envelope is so clutch. But um, first of all, we love Jalen. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing yes. that. But also, he's a perfect example of... I've read his name and seen his profile picture for so long now uh-huh. and so many times that I He's was Nightcrawler, shocked. Right? I was like, oh, that's what he looks like? Whoa. And, yeah. and not in a bad way. Just you get so used to the profile picture. Like here's another one. Sean, if you're listening, one of our super friends, it has a picture of Wanda. So like for some reason, I always just associate right. Sean with Wanda. <laughs> and I'm sure if I saw Sean, I'd be like, wait, that's not Elizabeth Olsen. You know? <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's so good. The envelope is so clutch there, by the way. Nice move. Felt very um, official. Does a- Alex also has a uh, a Wanda profile pic, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, he has a yes, he has a zoomed in picture of Wanda as Scarlet Witch, and I think, dude, this is weird. I we have a lot of listeners that have profile pictures, so I don't know this, but I remember Sean is more just all red because it's like the further out Wanda, like oh Scarlet- yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> so, <but> yeah. <laughs> Um, but these these are all these are all like uh, uh, super friends, so that's it's a smaller group. That's yeah. how I know. Yeah, fair. Anyways, fair. Uh, uh, Eric Martin totally deserving. In, in this case, I thought hands down slam dunk the winner here because I think the writing is so much of the focus of that show. Like so much of the show that that works for me is the writing, and I'm mm-hmm. with you. If we made a list right now of like MCU people that we think would be fun to have on this show, Eric Martin would be mm-hmm. in my top five right now mm-hmm. of people I want to talk to. Yeah. I uh, I really, again, if if we wound up in a situation, and I've said this before, where we had Waldron and Eric Martin, and then yes. we had Moorhead and Benson for the yes. finales, finale yeah. or finales of the multiverse saga, man, that would be... Let's talk to Disney. Right? Just get him on the phone once again. Come on, Kevin. Uh, Best director. Hey, hey, hey. to be fair, we do have a contact at Disney that's awesome. So there's a chance. Hey, true, true. Shout out. Not going to say the name, Uh, (laughs) but shout out. Yeah, we we (laughs) will drop her name. Let's drop her email just too. Hey, Uh, you said her. Dang it. You just ruled out 50% of the people. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Best director. Now this is, I think, the closest category that we had. Okay, as it should and be. And we have, I will say, uh, the the top two contenders here, there is one got 51% of the vote and one got 47. Holy cow. So okay. that is how close we're talking. That is by far closer than anything else in this year's uh, awards. So our nominees... Peyton Reed for Quantumania, James Gunn for Guardians, Ali Salim for Secret Invasion, Benson and Moorhead for Loki, specifically uh, episodes one, four, five, and six, Nia DaCosta for the Marvels, and Brian Andrews for What If season two. So I want to quickly say this first the two nominees are going to be James Gunn and Benson and Moorhead. I'm almost positive. But before you announce the winner to that, Connor, another listener on Discord, um, just pointed out something interesting that he felt like Nia DaCosta deserved a shout out because she must have done pretty good work that a lot lot of, like the, the takeaway from the Marvels isn't often the acting or the writing. And that 
she did a really good job of kind of wrangling that all together into a very like kind of slick film. And I do think that's yeah. fair. She's not yeah. going to be one of the categories, but I did think that the overall flow of that movie was pretty well done. Shout out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, man, it, yeah. It, again, I, I'm so excited for our phase five rewatch and discussions and, and we'll have to figure out when we would do that to call it a rewatch. But at, at any rate, I think it's fascinating, even just as we're kind of closing out the awards here that we began the year with Quantumania and ended with the Marvels. And it's the movie that fell between those that people generally see as the, the kind of bright spot within MCU films this year. But I, I really, and I think that's, I think that it was the best MCU film this year. I think uh, just you and I have kind of said that. But both the Marvels and Quantumania, for totally different reasons, I think got really short shift. And, and I, I think short shrift. Shrift? Short changed, <laughs> I think. No, 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 no. Oh, gosh. Now I'm going to, I mean, I've got to, I've got to check myself on this. But any, <laughs> my point being, uh, especially the Marvels, though, because I think a lot of people have this perception. You and I have talked about this. Short shrift. Yes. Oh, uh, wow. I was right. Okay. Uh, people have this perception that the Marvels was a, was a flop. And commercially, it certainly was. But I don't, I just don't feel like there's any, there's nothing that I see on screen that merits that characterization from a critical perspective. Uh, and and so Dude. I'm totally with Connor there. I, I think Nia DaCosta did an excellent job. She was having to juggle a lot of things there. But again, we talked not... about this so many times, though. Oh, okay, we can't get into this. People, <laughs> I think, mostly have kind of made up their mind on if they're into it or not. And I don't think the Marvels is on the same level as, say, Civil War. For me, like, I'm not as emotionally connected to it at all. I don't think it's as tight of a story. I don't think it's doing as well, you know, acting front, any of those things. Uh -huh. But it's so strange to me. It, it, like, again, the commercial flop, I think that's more people are tired of it or have made up their mind or whatever. But I'm with you in that I don't, like on this podcast, we're willing to critique when we feel like it was a huge misstep, like we did for the Echo finale. We feel like that yeah. show had something really going and then they way sidestepped. Like, I just don't think you leave the Marvels feeling that way. Like, if you right. go in with a, like a genuine good faith of, I want to enjoy this movie. Like, don't go in with a, I hate this or I know this sucks or I know it's bad. Go in being like, hey, I want to watch a fun movie. I think yeah. you'll leave pleasantly surprised. I, I just don't think the box office flop matches with a quality flop. I just don't think we're yeah. watching the same things. Anyways. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if we were in a different era of the MCU, uh, it's a movie that like I, people are just putting so much pressure on everything now to be yes, like Amen. some game changing thing or Amen. it's a failure. Amen. Uh, but you know how I know that? that? Said, the only thing people talk about from the, that movie is the post credit sequence or like the very end right. with Kate. No one's even talking about the right. movie, but keep going. But our our winner here is not Nia DaCosta. Uh, it is with 51% of the vote, Guardians James are Gunn. Guardians over Loki. For Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I will say from a directing standpoint... I think I would vote Benson and Moorhead for me. But I, I think you yeah. could argue the stamp factor with James. Yeah, yeah. But again, yeah, and there's also kind of the legacy thing that you brought up with Bradley that I, yeah, I, think, I think is so, certainly yeah. in play. Uh, I, I think I would give it to Benson and Moorhead personally. Me, um, me too, I think. Just it, I, I came away from that, like even, even from a stamp perspective, like now that I've seen Moon Knight and something else, and, and been able to like compare those and see what it is they're bringing. I, I feel like they have as much of a stamp as, as gun does personally. It's okay. just, we haven't gotten quite as much of them yet, but yeah. Uh, okay. Still final, final very, few here. very much deserved final two, three, final three. Here we uh, go. and the big ones really, uh, best, best series, best series. Okay. And, 
This is not well, going to be a surprise to anyone. <laughs> was it our first ever unanimous? We joked about that. Was it our first ever unanimous? It no, it is ninety nine percent. Oh, someone voted. Who did? The it? Loki who, season who two. Who out there? But we did have a one percent vote for what if okay. season two, which I I love and hey, I get respect. That. I get respect. That. Respect. Yeah. No, no votes for Secret Invasion. That's again. That's part of the reason I like Benson and Moorhead as best director because I feel like. Season one of Loki is really good, but I feel like there's just a clear step up for season two, and it's mostly mm-hmm. felt in how the show is is physically put together. Like, you know, yeah. the thing I don't like about Lamentis kind of sidestepping, it feels like, right, for a second. Right. You don't get that in season two. It's the direction of, of everything overlaying on top of each other that feels mm-hmm. so right. And that's direction, yeah. I think. No, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that this is exactly right. Loki season two winning this. I think it is not only the best season or best television we got from the MCU this year. I think it may be the best television we've gotten from the MCU ever. And I think it's one of the best projects that we've gotten from the MCU ever. Uh, and I know that those are hot takes, but I don't think that many people listening would disagree. So that it's not a hot take. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think they might be hot takes outside of the the active, uh, like, outside of the FFW community. But I think in terms of the folks listening here, uh, it's always a hot take cool. when when you post something on social media and a couple comments are like, "This just reminds me of how bad the MCU is." And I'm like, "Did you watch Loki? Like, you realize right two two shows ago was one of the best things they've ever made. <laughs> You're not watching it. Is my point. You, you yeah. missed it." That okay, is true. Final two. Uh, best film here. Uh, not as much of a uh, of a almost unanimous category, I guess, but close. With ninety percent of the vote, we had Guardians winning out over Quantumania and the Marvels. But both Quantumania Deserved. and the Marvels got a vote. They both yes. Uh, Quantumania got one percent of the vote. There you uh, go. The Marvels got nine percent of the vote. Hey, hey, whoever did that, my respect, respect, bro. This is the tip your cap, <laughs> tip your cap type stuff right there. Whoever did that, I love it so and much. And again, uh, finally, that sort of wraps our 2023 here. But before yes. we end our awards, we do have to always look ahead. Our preview to the most anticipated Marvel of 2024. Now, this was a strange one. Uh, Echo got a little bit orphaned here because by the time we were having people vote, Echo had already run its course, so it would not make sense to have it on the most anticipated list. Sure. But we will come back and talk about that uh, next season. Our nominees here were Agatha, Darkhold Diaries, Deadpool 3, Eyes of Wakanda, Madam Web. Your Friendly Neighborhood, Spider-Man, the renamed Spider-Man Freshman Year, Venom 3, X-Men 97, which is coming very soon, and Craven the Hunter. What, what would you have here. voted for if you voted? What would you have voted for as we're closing here? I, well, I would have voted for the winner here. Uh, so I'll give my answer when I announce the winner, <laughs> but I'm curious what your answer would be. Well, I found when I did vote, I did vote. I found it such a hard category for me because it's like a perfect storm year where the only MCU film coming out is something that I've never seen the first two of. So I I can't say Deadpool 3 is my most anticipated because I I didn't watch the first two because I thought I wouldn't like them. That's why I didn't see them originally. (laughs) And then the show, like the main live action show, Agatha, Mm Mm-hmm is the one show that I was like, do we need that show from WandaVision, which is my favorite show? Like, is, is right. that the that's, spinoff yeah, we that's, need? Yeah, that puts you in a real weird spot. But then almost all the rest of the stuff is either non-MCU or animated. And like, I don't have a ton of tied to the animated stuff yet. We'll see. So I, right. I voted for Agatha. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, that, you were not alone. Uh, Agatha got a decent amount of votes. But our winner here is Deadpool 3. Yeah. Which is the one that I find 
I've been looking forward to for a lot of reasons. Now, I should say I am not... Uh, I, I am not a huge Deadpool guy, either in the comics or in the movies. I, I think I've probably said this before. My theory with the Deadpool films, I, I, I feel like one in five jokes in those movies uh, is very funny. And they have, there are so many jokes that that actually does make it a very funny movie. But that also, like, there's a still volume four shooter. out of five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, it, it's, it, but it's just, and, and I, I think a lot of people would say the first film is better. I actually prefer the la, second. La, la, la. I don't want to know anything. La, 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 la. Well, no, I'm not talking about plot. I'm just saying, I think that the second one, be, to me, veers away from some of the kind of like locker room humor and gets a little bit more meta, which is more my scene. But and would be mine, yes. So I, I th- I'm curious to see how, where where you fall. But all that aside, I'm just really, I think that it this is coming at a really interesting time, like I said earlier, mm-hmm. where there's a lot of conversation about what the MCU's done right and wrong. There are, you know, we had the authors of a book come on the show and talk about how like there's sort of the MCU through the Infinity Saga to talk about and the MCU now to talk about and when that dividing line is. And then I I just think that Deadpool was always going to be an opportunity for them to do what we got a hint of in She-Hulk, which is poke fun at themselves, which is something that I think that Marvel, it's a a good moment to do that. And this Mm -hmm. is a great project to do that in. And then on top of all that, watching what we're watching now, getting ready, like on the X-Men side, I'm just genuinely very excited to see Hugh Jackman come back. Wolverine. In in the Wolverine and 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 in the yellow suit, it's just I, I, I think, think it's going to be a really really fun time. The Wolverine thing is the hook for me, and it's not even close. Like if Wolverine sure. wasn't in this, because I haven't seen the other two, I don't know. Like I don't know that I'd care at all for that style of humor, or like I'm not excited for it at yeah. all. Adding Wolverine cranks it up fifty percent for me. The second part of it, I would say, is I'm almost more curious because I know it's going to be such a needle mover. I'm more mm-hmm. curious than excited. I almost want to watch like a, a car crash from afar. That's kind of how I feel where it's <laughs> like, not, not that it'll be bad, but like right, how, right. how is this going to fit into the MCU and, and how are they going to tie that all up? I'm more like genuinely curious is the word. You know what I'm, what I'm actually really excited about and, and what I anticipate with this project. I, I don't know that I ever would have, framed it this way, you know, a year or two ago, but if we are in fact going to be doing a thing, you know, which the Marvels is previewing where we're having other Marvel universes of, of yesteryear, whether that be the, the Raimi stuff or X-Men or beyond, I kind of like that, uh, you know, if those are all elements that show up in a Secret Wars film, I like that we are doing it first here in a in a more like comedy focused way because I think that so many of those projects are so dumb like the Ghost Rider movies are just bad <laughs> the original Fantastic 4 movies like I know we have people that are big fans I think that they had elements of them that were good but a lot of there were also very bad yes. elements like and so I think that it would be strange. Like you would have to make fun of them, I guess is my point. And I don't really want to burn a lot of time in a movie like Secret Wars doing that. Excellent point. Yeah, because then we'd be like, this is way too jokey for how serious this is. And who cares about the Fox universe right now if all these universes are colliding? Like, Who cares about that? But to do it here is genius so that maybe whatever we're left with is actually the parts of the Fox verse that we care about by the time Secret Wars yeah. rolls around. Or maybe, you know, it, it reframes them in kind of a like in the same way that that No Way Home sort of reframed the Andrew Garfield. Yeah, stuff. but even even there, I would say there's not as much disparity, right? So like the No Way Home stuff was reflecting on five yeah. other films that weren't as bad as these ones. Like in general, for sure, Spider-Man for sure. 2 is beloved and, and a lot of people love the Andrew Garfield stuff, even if we don't as yeah. much. So I'm with you. Like there's less making fun in that movie that needs to be done. 
And, and yeah. we got a little bit of it, you know, like damn eels, man. You know, like we got that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 right. But like Secret but no, Wars I would, think, have to, would have to have 20 minutes of it <laughs> to talk about no, like Ghost yeah, Rider. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why like, I, you know, Jennifer Garner being in this, I think, is <laughs> yes, such yes, a great yes. example of that. Like, perfect. That's so perfect. Yeah, I, I'm I, that's so that's what I'm excited about. I think it's just like you know we're backing up here. You know, Endgame came out in 2019. It's now 2024. Uh, Endgame was just over the 10 year mark of the MCU. If you remember when Infinity War came out, there there was the big. Uh, like 10 year thing that was on all the Marvel logos that year. And mm-hmm. so really like we are, we are now like halfway on the other side uh, of the infinity saga. And I think that it's a really perfect time to kind of check in. And I don't know what that's going to look like. Like I said earlier, that Matthew Vaughn quote uh, is intriguing to me. If even if it's just meant to be intriguing and there's no substance behind it, so well, even I, even I think, just the statement is debatable. Of does the MCU need saving is a whole thing in and of itself. Well, and that's a whole that's a whole conversation to have about what that even means, right? Like, does that yeah, mean correct. that the MCU is like is that a commentary on the quality or the commercial success of the MCU? Because I think mm-hmm. that in terms of you know the the difference in how often people talk to me about Marvel things now versus two years ago. I mean, it's night and day. Night and day. So in that sense, yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of hard thing is is like... But it, that's not wh- strictly because of quality. Look, right. the MCU is not dead. Uh, congratulations to all our winners. I think some of these winners prove the MCU is not dead. Absolutely. And then, as always, this is a good time to say thank you so much to our community. Not only just the people who do support us financially on Friends from Work Plus and voted on this. Mm -hmm. Like, this is so fun for us to have you guys choose it. Thank you so much for all you do. We couldn't do – I'll look at the camera. We couldn't do this without you guys, seriously. So thank you very much. And then also to everyone who's just listening, thank you. Like, this is a really fun Mm -hmm. time of the year for us to reflect on that stuff. But then I'll just close it in saying – we are literally just getting started. You may be thinking to yourself, how in the world are, gonna, are they going to talk about stuff all the way to July with that being the next uh, MCU film? But man, we have so much planned. We have some fun, just generic film stuff planned, but we have some rewatching the MCU stuff. And, and mm-hmm. like we feel not called, but we feel like we have a, a special place in our heart for some of these rewatch films to point out mm-hmm. some of the things that maybe you didn't like the first time and actually find a, a different way to look at something that maybe you'll like it more. Uh, when we go through mm-hmm. it. And then on Friends from Work Plus, if you do choose to support us financially, a really fun journey through the Fox universe and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's going to be a lot going on getting our minds right for X-Men 97 and Deadpool 3. And then you think to yourself, like, you no know, long term, like, oh, there's not much going on. Well, as soon as we kind of get towards the end of the year, next year looks so jam-packed. So it's going to be right away back into the kind of crazy yeah, content true. machine. So thank you so much, all of you. We are so thankful to have you here. And we'll see you right back here next time on Friends from Work. Friends from Work.